It is the privilege of the university to confer an honorary degree upon individuals who merit recognition as a symbol of our high esteem. Dr. Catherine A. High, a hematologist by training, began her career studying the molecular basis of blood coagulation and the development of novel therapeutics for bleeding disorders. Her pioneering bench-to-bedside studies of gene therapy for hemophilia led to a series of studies that characterized the human immune response to gene delivery vectors. As the director of the Center for Cellular and Molecular Therapeutics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Dr. High assembled a multidisciplinary team of scientists and researchers working to discover new gene and cell therapies for genetic diseases and to facilitate rapid translation of preclinical discoveries into clinical application. While at CHOP, Dr. High was an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and held an endowed chair at the University of Pennsylvania's Perlman School of Medicine. In 2013, Spark Therapeutics, a biotechnology company based in Philadelphia, was formed based on programs that Dr. High had led at CHOP. In 2014, she joined Spark full-time as president and head of research and development. At Spark, Dr. High led the development of the first FDA-approved gene therapy for a genetic disease, for a rare form of congenital blindness, as well as the development of a gene therapy for hemophilia B that is now in late phase testing. Dr. High served on the FDA Advisory Committee on Cell, Tissue, and Gene Therapies, and as a past president of the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. She currently serves on the board of directors of CRISPR Therapeutics and Insight Corporation. She is the author of more than 200 scientific papers and holds multiple patents on gene therapy. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine of the Royal College of Physicians. For her lifelong commitment to pioneering cures for genetic diseases, Drexel is proud to confer upon Dr. Catherine A. High the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Drexel University, under the charter issued by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I confer upon Dr. Catherine High the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa, and admit you to all the dignities, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. In token thereof, Dr. High will receive the diploma and hood of Drexel University. Congratulations, Dr. High. Thank you, President Fry. I'd like to start today by congratulating all of the graduates, those in the medical school and in the graduate schools, and your families and friends who have supported you in reaching this key milestone in your career. For the medical school graduates, it's estimated that nearly one in six practicing physicians in the U.S. completed part of their training in Philadelphia. So today you are joining a mighty throng. Medicine and the research that makes it better represent an ancient calling and one that forms a bedrock of all civilizations. A student once asked Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist, what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected an answer like fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones. But no, Mead answered that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was a femur that had been broken and then healed. In the animal kingdom, she explained, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger. You cannot get to the river for a drink or hunt for food. No animal survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. A broken femur that has healed is evidence that someone has taken time to stay with the one who fell, has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. Mead said. 
No matter where your career takes you beyond today, it will be centered on helping other people through difficulty. But remember that this is a two-way street. My own career has been heavily focused on biomedical research, first in the laboratory and then in the clinic. And we were fortunate to help develop some of the first gene therapies that have come into clinical practice. But over the course of many years, one thing that has been true for me is that I have learned much more from my patients than I could ever have imagined. I would strongly encourage you to make time to listen to your patients. They can tell you far more about the experience of a disease than a textbook can. But more than that, they can share with you the wisdom of life, the challenges of being a good son or daughter, of being a parent, of problems with your in-laws, of being frustrated in a career path, of being treated unfairly in one situation or another, and on the positive side of the ledger of small things that made them happy every day or of choices that they made that turned out to be the right ones. You will be with them at some of the most vulnerable moments in their lives, and if you make the time, they will share with you the things that they have learned. There were patients I took care of over 40 years ago that I still remember clearly now. When I was a hematology fellow, I had a wonderful patient named Mary, an older woman, still attractive in her 80s, gentle but very insightful, always perfectly dressed for her appointments with me. I was following her for multiple myeloma, a blood cancer which had not as good a prognosis in those days as it does today. And she was coming to the end of her course as her kidneys were starting to fail. One summer evening when she had been admitted with a new problem, I came by to see her since I was the physician who followed her in the outpatient clinic. The light was fading, it was coming on to eight o'clock. I sat down next to her bed and we started to talk. She had worked for many years part-time in a jewelry store. Her presence radiated a fondness for lovely things, not just jewelry, but gardens, happy family meals, all things well tended, and it also radiated a sense of endless time and patience for whatever might arise. These were commodities, enjoyment of the beauty in the world, and a sense of unlimited time that were in scarce supply in my own life just then and in the lives of most of the trainees that I knew. As we talked on that summer evening, I was gradually drawn into her world. We were talking, I think, about food for picnics. She asked me if I had ever made mayonnaise from scratch, and I conceded that I had not. She proceeded to give me in exquisite detail her recipe for homemade mayonnaise, which I still remember. She promised me that if I went home and made that recipe, I would never buy a store-bought mayonnaise again. Well, I never made that recipe, but I did, after that, occasionally read recipes for making mayonnaise, which I'd never done before. And whenever I did, I thought of her, her sense of wonder about both natural and man-made objects of beauty, and her sense of the luxury of time. I suspect that she knew that I would never make homemade mayonnaise, but her speaking about it and my listening to her enriched both of our lives in a way that may be difficult for me to explain, but that I hope you will experience. We're living in a time of extraordinary changes brought on by biomedical research that are leading to better treatments and different outcomes for age-old scourges like hemophilia sickle cell disease and cancer. Some of you will do the research that will lead to discovery of new treatments. Some of you will work to develop these new treatments in the clinic. But whatever you choose as your career path, make sure that it's something that you feel is really worth doing. If you believe in the value of what you're doing, if you know that it's a worthwhile use of your talents and your energy, You'll have the fortitude and the long view that you need to help overcome obstacles along the way. When I was a new faculty member, I was nearly overwhelmed on several occasions by challenging faculty politics, or at other times by the difficulties of balancing a career with the demands of three young children. 
I resolved on a number of occasions to abandon my research career for a simpler life. But each time I did this, I found myself saying, yes, I will definitely seek something less demanding as soon as I figure out why the liver cell line I'm working with makes all the clotting factors except for one, or some other research question that was at the heart of what I was doing just then. After a while, I recognized a pattern. There was always one more hill to climb before leaving what I was doing. And I saw that the passion for the work always outweighed the problems that stood in the way, and I kept going. But I think this only happens when you're fortunate enough to be doing something that you really love. Before I close, I need to acknowledge that you are the first group of graduates in my lifetime to graduate in the time of a global pandemic. You will have a front row seat as clinical investigation determines whether there are drugs that make the course of the disease less severe and whether biomedical research can find a better antiviral treatment or a vaccine that protects most of us from this illness. The people who will mentor you have no direct experience of anything like this pandemic coronavirus. When I was a young hematologist, the closest similar challenge was HIV. AIDS was first described clinically in 1981 and HIV was isolated as the causative virus in 1983. It was nearly a decade before the first antiretroviral drug, AZT, was developed and approved, and truly effective combination therapy that converted AIDS from a lethal disease to a chronic condition was not available until 1995. And as all of you know, we still don't have an HIV vaccine. Through that lens, progress against COVID-19 seems rapid indeed, since the causative virus was identified and sequenced within weeks of the description of the first cases. And now several months into the pandemic, we've identified at least one antiviral drug that can shorten the course of the illness for some patients. At the beginning of the AIDS era, there was very little understanding of how the disease was transmitted. We already understand that COVID-19 is spread primarily through respiratory droplets. Its highly contagious nature, though, has made the job of the frontline healthcare worker doubly difficult. In addition to medical management, in the face of imperfect treatments and a good deal of uncertainty, those on the front lines may find themselves trying to bring comfort to people who may be facing their last moments without their loved ones nearby. You will need all the courage, empathy, and medical insight that you can muster. As you contribute to, and in some cases help to lead, the world's response to this current infectious disease challenge, I encourage you to remember that you are part of a profession that is a foundation of civilization. Use your talents to discover and to innovate. The way out of this crisis has not yet been found. Listen to your patients, support your colleagues, and take care of yourselves and your families. In closing, I would like to remind you of these words of Ralph Waldo Emerson and his definition of success. To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know that one life has breathed easier because you lived here. This is to have succeeded. Congratulations to all of you and may you enjoy great success in the years ahead.